guys now that are still on tour and I remember some of them still have voices. Some of them still have voices. Some of them don't. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead and open. Go ahead and open your Bibles. It's a simple mute button that solved that problem. Uh, to Genesis chapter 12. We are going to do, I think, all right, where am I? A quick review just to kind of catch ourselves up. So last week we started looking at the, um, the, what we're calling the nation land seed promise. You guys remember that? We, we touched on that. Yep. And it started, the original uh, part of the promise actually started with the seed promise in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, right? So right after the fall, right after the serpent had tempted Eve and Adam, and they both ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God then... Um, brings down a curse on all three participants, right? Uh, the woman's going to have her pain increase during childbirth. The man is going to have his, uh, his toil, his labor, his pain increased as he works the land. There are going to be thorns and thistles and things like that that he didn't have to deal with before. Uh, but the serpent, the curse on the serpent was really the interesting part of this because in the curse on the serpent, if you remember, in 315, God speaking to the serpent, he says, there will be enmity or hostility between you and the woman, between your seed or your offspring and her offspring, and you will bruise him or he, he will bruise you on the head, right? So we kind of talked about that being a fatal blow. You step on the head of a snake, what happens? Kills. Kill the snake, right? but you will bruise him on the heel. So there is an injury that occurs, right? And we know now that that is the crucifixion. There's an injury that occurs, but it's not a fatal injury, okay? But the important part that we kind of pulled out of that is that this, this hostility is between the seed of woman and the seed of the serpent, okay? So we're talking about offspring here. And then we kind of followed that through um, the genealogy, right, talking about the seed, we looked at the genealogy from Adam all the way to Abram, and we ended that in uh, Genesis chapter 11, right at the end there where, um, was it Terah, what's his father's name, Terah, uh, uh, had three sons, and Abram was one of those three sons, and then Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses is where we did a little camping last week. And we identified this promise. And God said, go out, right? He's, he's, Abram is in the land, uh, it's called Ur of the Chaldeans, which is way over east of what we now know to be Israel. And actually the land, the Chaldeans and the Babylonians, that's like the same territory, okay? So he's over by the Euphrates River. And um, God tells him, pick up your stuff, pack up your bags, and just start going, right? When he made the promise, when he gave him the instruction, he didn't even tell him where. He says, go to the land where I will show you. And we know later in Genesis 15 that, uh, that it, it is stated that um, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, Right? Uh, where is it? Malachi, I think, that repeats that. Is it Malachi? Yeah, one of the minor prophets. So he repeats that. Uh, and we're going to look, if we get to it, hopefully this morning, um, we should in Galatians, Paul uh, references the same thing, talking about what that means to us. 
Okay, so that's kind of the direction that we're heading there. So let's get back through here. All right, here's the genealogy we looked at. Uh, here's the promise, right? So we also identified that we've got, it, it, scripture doesn't necessarily do this, but the promise itself is kind of broken up into two parts, just the way that we approach it. You've got the physical part, which is the nation and the land. And that is generally viewed in that context because those are physical uh, fulfillments, right? Israel becomes a literal nation of people and they're given a specific plot of dirt, right? A specific piece of land. So that's the physical aspect. So you've got the nation land and seed promise. And that is considered to be the spiritual side of the promise because of what results from the seed of Abram uh, coming into the world. Even though the seed coming, right, and the man Jesus was the physical manifestation of the seed, it's the blessing that it's a spiritual part because the promise that God gave to Abram, if you remember, was that in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's the spiritual component. We're going to take a look at that here in just a little bit, okay? There, oh, there it was right there, verse, uh, and in you, so that's in verse 3, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. All right, so we looked at this, so we've got the promise expanded, reiterated, uh, and these are different places that you can look at it. I can't remember, let's look real quickly at Genesis 22 and 18, did we take a look at this last week? All right, this is one of the reiteration, and it's, it's not new material, it's just uh, here we have a very specific uh, statement again, 2218, in your seed, so God gets a little more specific here, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice, okay? So through the seed of Abram, Abraham at this point, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In 22, three, I'm sorry, in 12, 3, he said, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Here he says, in your seed, okay? So he's getting more specific about what his plan is and how he's going to bring about this blessing. And so <clears throat> as you continue on through Genesis, we see that this same promise is, again, restated to Isaac in 26, chapter 26. And then, can you, I'm standing right in the way of you ladies to give us a seat. See if I can do this right. I'm not my coffee. Let's see if that works. Is that better? Okay. All right, so in 26, we've got the promise restated to Isaac. And then in 28, it is renewed to Jacob. So here we have the, the three fathers, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Is not God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? We get that repeated all throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament Scripture, don't we? So the fathers, this promise is renewed to them. And what we're going to see here in just a minute is that it doesn't even stop here. He renews it to Moses. He renews it to the people of Israel. And he renews it to Joshua as he's getting ready to lead them into the land. Uh, so it is. Um, this is a significant promise that God has made and continued to make for hundreds of years. He brought this up over and over and over again as the people hit these various milestones, if you will, benchmarks in um, their progression toward, the full, toward its fulfillment, right? So whenever something new would happen, they would end up in a different land, uh, a different uh, a different person, a different leader would rise to the top, then the promise was renewed again so that they never forgot about what God was doing specifically through them as a people, okay? That's important because we as the church need to understand that God has given promises just like he gave them responsibilities, right? If you look at uh, who we talked to last week, somebody came up to me afterwards because, you know, in, in Deuteronomy, um, uh, was it 28 through, or 27 through 29, I think, 28 through 30, where is it? The, it's called the law of blessing and cursing. Mm -hmm. God says, listen, if you, if you obey my commandments, you listen to what I'm telling you, all these blessings, it's a laundry list. 
a blessing. All these blessings are going to be yours. But if you do not obey my voice, these are all the curses that are going to come upon you. Right? So he continued to promise to them, if you will but obey my voice, you will be blessed. And this even goes back to the promise he made to Abraham, right? And you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God is looking for, he is working towards and utilizing mankind, his chosen people, to bring about the manifestation of his blessing from heaven onto earth. Okay? Common thing. The blessings of heaven onto the, you know, terra firma, right? Uh, and, and, and it's all in an effort to get us back to where? To God. To God, yes, but specifically the garden, it, which is where God, right? That's the relationship. That's the presence. That, that's the, the, the relationship that heaven, where heaven and earth come together and God has been working since the whole thing got kind of destroyed. And God has been working ever since then to redeem the earth and to redeem mankind, right? We don't talk, of, we're not, this class is not about the redemption of earth. But listen, if you go to Romans chapter 8 and you read through Romans 8 and you read about how the earth is groaning waiting for the redemption, waiting for the coming of the Son of God. I may even say the Son of Man. Okay, it's talking about the return when everything's going to be renewed, right? So even the creation itself is longing for, waiting for the fulfillment of the promises, the ultimate promise of God, okay? So any questions or comments up to this point? Okay. Did we look at this last week? You we didn't have your slides last week. Hmm. That's right. Um, okay. So let's uh, speaking about the seed. Then so let, let's take a look at Galatians chapter three, because this is where we start to get an idea of how these Old Testament promises relate to us, and why is it important that we even look at this part of history, right? Um, so we're going to get a little insight into that. So if you're not familiar with the Galatian letter, this is the Apostle Paul has written a letter, and Galatia is actually a region. It's not a city like Corinth or Ephesus or Philippi. Uh, this is a region. So this letter was written and intended to be read among a group of churches. And this is all north and maybe a little west of where we know Israel to be, okay? Okay. And so this is the letter, and the, the, the reason for the letter, the purpose of it was because the Galatian people, the churches up there, had kind of been infiltrated by Judaizers. These are, are Jewish Christians, if you will, that had come up out of Jerusalem up into the Galatian region, and they were trying to um, mandate that the churches up there Yes, believe in Christ, be baptized, just as Paul wrote, even in uh, the end of chapter 2. Uh, he said, I've been crucified with Christ, yet it's no longer I that live, but Christ living in me. He says, yes, the Judaizers are saying, yes, that's good, but you also must follow the law of Moses, specifically circumcision, to identify yourself as a Jewish Christian, Right? So Judaism was still very important. Paul's writing this letter to say, no, no, no. You don't need this. All right? And it, essentially, he's saying Christ alone is enough. You don't need to worry about the law. And if you read the, the Roman letter, um, especially in chapter 7, and well, even here, he talks about why the law then. Right? We're going to get into that here in just a minute. So looking at chapter 3. Uh, let's start in verse 6. I got Galatians 3 open. Mm -hmm. All right. Even so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. This is what we would say is the, the word justification <clears throat> defined. Abraham was given credit as being righteous, even though he wasn't righteous, right? We know if you're, you're familiar with the story of Abraham. Uh, he was a liar. 
right? He was a manipulator. Uh, so he was in and of himself. Let me let me qualify that. In and of himself, he was not a righteous man. But because he believed God, listen, and nothing else. Because he believed God, he was justified in the eyes of God. Okay? That's it. And that's the point that Paul's trying to make to the Galatian people. All right? Um, and that's why I used him as an example. So right after that, he says, Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of the faith or of faith who are sons of Abraham. So the descendants. And we're going to see here in a second, he refers to the promise. He's, he's referring here to the promise that was given that we just looked at all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. All right. He says those who are of faith, you don't have to be of the direct seed line of Abraham to be called a son of Abraham, which is, by the way, part of the problem that the Pharisees had when they were confronting Jesus, Right. We are sons of Abraham. Our, our father is Abraham. And Jesus said, uh, God can bring up sons of Abraham from the rocks. Right? So Paul's point here is that it has it is not because of your bloodline, it is because of your belief. Okay? Therefore, be sure it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. All right, that's us, by the way. If you didn't know that, that's talking about you and I right there. Okay, <laughs> preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations, and by the way, if you don't know this, most of you probably do, but when, when we see in scripture a reference to the nations, he's talking about Gentiles, he's talking about the non Jewish world, he's talking about uh, basically everybody in the world except for Israel. Okay. All those who are not God's chosen people, they are the nations, right? Um, okay, all the days. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer, all right? So um, here we have this idea then that we are justified just like Abraham is because we believe just like Abraham did. That's the idea. And... Um, all right, so if we continue, let's look over at verse 16 then. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say unto seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed. So he's referring here about the, the one through whom the promises will be fulfilled. Okay, so we looked at last week the genealogy from Adam to Abraham. Uh, have you ever looked at in Matthew and in Luke, we also have genealogies. Uh, one takes us back from Jesus backward to David. The other one takes us from Jesus all the way back to Adam. We can see that there is a physical genealogical record from Adam to Noah to Abram to David all the way through the line of Judah, right? The tribe of Judah all the way to the coming of the Christ all the way to this man, Jesus, born in a manger in Bethlehem, right? Came out as a Nazarene and died, lived and died so that you and I could be sitting here having this conversation this morning. That's just fantastic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think that is just fantastic. Who, somebody just had a hand up. Mary, you know, over in Hebrews 11, where the faith of all the faithful, uh -huh. of course, Abraham is in there, but... Uh, Abraham was human, just like me. Right. And uh, it says in verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord. And two verses later, Abraham said, how can I know this? Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe you guys don't feel it. But to me, it's comforting Yeah. to know that even though God knew his heart, and I, somehow there was something there that God saw that we don't. That's right. <clears throat> and, and, and you're exactly right. One of the things that's comforting to me, I, I have mentioned this several times over the years, that, you know, there's, we all have like Bible people, Bible characters maybe that you kind of connect with or relate to or, you know, one's favorite. We have a favorite verse and a favorite book and so forth. 
Um, there's one guy in scripture that I probably relate to more than anyone else. And there's only a verse or two mentioned of him. No names given, nothing. And it's the man who cries out, Jesus saying, if I can, hmm. right? And he says, if you believe I can do anything. And the man cries out, he says, I do believe, help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. And one of the times, that, you know, we've read that kind of stuff over and over and over again. And there was something about some one time I read it. I'm like, Ugh. you know, it just got me because I relate. So I do believe, but like Abraham, how can I know? Yeah. Right. How can I know that these promises are going to be fulfilled? God help my unbelief. And so it's comforting uh, to be sure. Yes, ma'am. Well, another thing about uh, amazing Abraham is that, you know, this keeps talking about his belief and right. God knew his heart, but Abraham acted on it. I mean, he left. Yeah. He just up and took everything he had and he left. He did. That's right. So I think that's, that's what we see as a human because we can't see the heart, but we can see the actions of it. That's right. And, and that's, I, I think that's an important distinction, not necessarily germane to what we're talking to, to this pursuit, but it is important because it's just like everything else, right? Um, everything we do starts internally, right? Belief starts here and it starts here and then it's manifested. It is revealed through our actions, but it, it's important to recognize that scripture says Abraham believed God. Right. And as a result of that, he was justified in the eyes of God, right? Mm -hmm. God reckoned to him as righteousness because of his belief. Mm -hmm. And it was because of his belief that he left, yeah. no question about it, right? But it was his belief that justified him, okay? Not the fact that he left, right. at least according to scripture, right? Okay, so um, our final, uh, verse here that I want us to look at in uh, Galatians 3 is verse 29. Okay. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs, right? We inherit, we are the inheritors, heirs according to promise. What promise do you reckon he's talking about here? It was made all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The promise that he retold, reiterated, renewed over and over and over again throughout the generations. You and I are heirs according to that promise. Okay? Um, all right. Any questions or comments about where we are at this point? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd like that to expand on what Ms. Sherry said. Okay. Um, yes, there is a definite belief, but just as the New Testament says, um, I know that's one after um, Abraham, but faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. And so that belief, yes, um, is key, but acting upon that belief is what really got us to where we are today. That yeah, there's no question. And um, I... I well, brought me to um, Hebrews 11, not pretty much that full chapter, but um, in 6 of Hebrews 11, and without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, mm -hmm. but that he's, a, that he's a rewarder of those who seek him, right. which is the action part. And then he, he keeps on expounding on how, the, how, how Noah, how Abraham, how other one of our examples. Yeah, no, there's no question about it. And that's, that's why I think it's important to understand that our actions, right, by their fruits, you will know their labors, right? All these, we, it's, the New Testament especially is replete with examples of how important it is for us to act on our faith. There's no question about it. The point that I was trying to make is that all the way through this, even Paul here, he's talking about how critical it is and, and what it is that allows us to be called one of the sons of Abraham. It is because we believe, we have faith just like Abraham did. Paul made the same point in 
um, in the Roman letter when he, and he even brought David into it. Uh, he said, Abraham was justified before the law. David was justified while under the law. This is Romans four. And likewise, you Roman people are justified while post law, if you will, right? While after the law. So justification by faith is the same method. Um, how do I say? So justification is by the same method of faith that it is today as it has always been, right? So um, it's, uh, you have to believe first, right? Because we know a lot of people, I do anyway, I'm guessing you guys do too, that do good things, right? Uh, there's a whole movement, I'm sure you've heard of it, called the social justice movement, right? These are all about people that want to do good things within society, but there's no faith attached to that. Their intentions may be honorable, that they want to help people, but, but their intentions are lost because they're not doing it to honor God. They're doing it, in many cases, to honor themselves. So <clears throat> I think it's critical that we, too, are uh, engaged in social justice type of work, right? I think it's important that we engage in that kind of work, but uh, we do it in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> and, um, and we do it because we have already been blessed. We are already heirs of the promise, and that is brought out. Listen, if we're not thinking about this stuff, how can we be happy about it? How can we experience joy if we're not thinking about meditating on all the blessings of God? And just like Paul wrote in the second Corinthian letter, he says, the love of Christ compels me. When we really embrace and absorb everything that God has done for us and who we are now in Christ, it should, in fact, compel us to take action, to bring about justice in the world, right? Okay, um, let's keep moving here. So this is what we have. I think I talked about the map that I didn't have up here last week, right? So, so here you can see the Euphrates, right? This is where Abram originated, Ur of the Chaldeans. This is Israel, way over Canaan land. To Canaan's land, we're on our way, right? Uh, this is it over here. And you remember last week I was talking about the river of Egypt is not the Nile, but it's the little, it's called the brook of Egypt or the Wadi El Arish. I don't know if you can see it from here. That's this little river right here that connects the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Okay. So this is actually kind of the boundary line that we, if you go and look at it, you can find it a couple other places throughout the Old Testament scripture that that's mentioned. So um, you're going to see that it's from here. Uh, all the way up here, all the way back over here is all the land that God promised to Abraham. Now, does this look anything like what we know to be Israel? Yeah. No, Israel is like a little strip of land right here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, that's Israel today. And what we'll be able to see is that Israel under Solomon's reign is much bigger, mm. right? So let's keep going. All right. It's, it's interesting, just as an anecdote, Chaldea was the same region that Babylon came out of. Right. And so you have out of that region both the greatest power of the world of that day and the greatest power of the heavens. Right. Both at work in that region. Yeah, that's a great point. And it's a, it's a whole nother study, but it is a fantastic study to start to identify how God originated or, or sometimes had really big things happen within certain regions where a God was the prominent God of like all the world. Right. And that's the case in Babylon. Right. We know they became a superpower. We know 400 years later, who's the superpower? It's Egypt. Right. And does do you guys know this? But the 10 plagues were not just 
uh, kind of levied against Pharaoh and the people of Egypt, but that each one of the 10 plagues corresponds to one of the Egyptian gods. And so it was a spiritual proclamation that Jehovah, right, the Almighty God, is the God above all gods. And uh, so each one of those plagues is God saying, I have dominion, I have authority over your little puny God, Egypt, right? And let me show you how. Uh, and ultimately, um, it, well, anyway, that's a, that's a cool story. But to Brandon's point, so we get this, um, uh, you get the, the world power, right? God is pulling someone out of the most powerful empire uh, and then moving him over and saying, you're going to be on my turf. We're going to establish some, a little bit of a, a cosmic geography here. And God's going to be taking over, and I will show all the nations how I am, in fact, the God above all gods. Okay? Paul reiterates this, too, if you're reading what well, we just read through his letters, right? Uh, how he put Christ above all principalities and rulers and dominions and authorities. That's God making the statement that Jesus Christ is the almighty God that is above every other name that can be named, right? So, um, all right, so let's keep going here. So here we have the fulfillment of the nation land promise. So we're going to, again, I mentioned this, we're going to kind of look at this in two parts. You've got the nation land part and then the, the seed part. So if we look at this, so here in Exodus 23, this is still at the beginning. If you're familiar with the history here, um, uh, the Israelites, have, so after this promise to Abram, uh, Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob, the sons, and then Jacob had 12 sons, and they end up through Joseph being sold into slavery and then becoming the number two power in all of Egypt, right? That's part of the story. We've reviewed this, bring the next one from this a few weeks ago. That um, <clears throat> then Jacob, whose name was changed to what? Israel. Changed to Israel, right? Uh, brought 75 of his family, his whole family, which was 75 persons in all, brought them to Egypt. And from there, within 400 years, they grew from 75 people to over 2 million people, mm -hmm. right? God rescues them, that's through the 10 plagues. Um, and then they are led out into the wilderness. The Egypt Pharaoh and his Egyptian army are all destroyed when they cross the Red Sea. Again, part of the, we're all familiar with the story, I think. And then Israel now is alone in the wilderness with their God. That's, that's the setting of where this is. God now, Jehovah, is giving them, he is reiterating what? The promise. He's saying, listen, I will fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, which is the Mediterranean, right? If you're, uh, we can go back there. But, uh, and from the wilderness, that's the Negev, uh, to the river Euphrates, which is all the way back over where Abram, Abraham came from, right? That's the Euphrates. I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you will drive them out before you. So God telling the people of Israel uh, that this is what's going to happen. All right. Here we now. This in Exodus twenty-three is at the beginning of their wanderings. Okay. This, so they'd only been in the wilderness for a year or less, I think, at this point. It was still very early on in uh, in their wandering. When we get to Deuteronomy chapter one, the forty years has passed. That's what Deuteronomy is. It's actually a retelling of the law. Um, all right, so he, at the beginning of this now, they're getting ready. God's getting ready to lead them into the promised land. He again reiterates the promise. Turn and set your journey. Go to the hill country of the Amorites, to all their neighbors in the Arabah, uh, or Arabah, in the hill country, the lowland, and the Negev, which is the wilderness that was referred to in Exodus. By the sea coast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. He's telling them again, this is... This is your dirt, guys. This is your land. This is the land that's flowing with milk and honey. All this stuff, this is all a description of the same piece of property. 
See, I have placed the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to them and you, to them and their descendants after them. That's what he's telling Israel. I promise to give the land to them, and I promise to give the land to you. Now is when it happens. Okay? So here, now, after the death of Moses, so we've got a change of leadership here. Joshua is taking over. The very beginning, Joshua chapter 1, came about after the death of Moses, servant of the Lord, that Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which you set the, you know, the sole of your foot treads, did I read that right? Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given to you just as I spoke to Moses. Again, he talks about the same piece of property here, right? Same uh, territory, all right? So now, if you're familiar with, with the uh, story of Joshua crossing the Jordan River, leading the people in, the conquering of the land, check this out. All that has taken place. Jericho marching around the city, the walls falling down, Israel getting routed at AI just right after that because they relied on themselves, and then praying to God and then being able to go back and conquer, right? All that has taken place. So we're at the end of this time, Joshua 21. So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they possessed it, lived in it. The Lord gave them rest on every side according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. No one of their enemies stood before them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hand, not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. God at this point has fulfilled the part of the promise that he made to Abram when he said, everywhere that you travel, I'm going to give this land to you and your descendants. That promise is fulfilled right here. Okay? Um, mission accomplished, I wrote at the top, right? So this is significant. This is a significant time in the history of Israel uh, and, the, and in the history of God's leading. And um, yeah, this is significant. This is a, a really important place in history. Okay. Any questions or comments about this? Kind of hit you with that rapid fire, but I really wanted to get through that so we could see how this all comes together. All right, let's continue on here. So, um, to get to King Solomon, we've got again a, a few hundred years between um, Joshua leading the people and the end of Joshua. There, <clears throat> they. Uh, what's the next book in the Bible after Joshua? Judges. judges, right? So um, the judges then kind of uh, uh, help to manage, I want to say rule, but it's really not rule, but they kind of rule. Um, they are the ones who are the arbiters, if you will, the mediators between God and the people, as they are the judges for the people. We know Samson, we know um uh, Deborah, we know Gideon, right? And so we have these great stories of these judges. And then we get to a point where the people of Israel say, um, we don't want to, we don't want God to judge us, to God to be our king through the judges. We want a king just like all the other nations. We want to look like all the other nations around us. Right. God told Samuel, because the people are saying this to Samuel, the prophet, God told Samuel, listen, don't be upset. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as their king. So do everything that the people tell you to do. They selected, who's the first king? Saul. Saul. Saul, because he was taller than all the other guys. He was good looking, right? He looked like a king. 
He was the kind of king that people chose for themselves. Looked presidential. He lo- that's right. Yeah, he looked he presidential. He looked regal. Like, you know, he looked like a king. And I think God let them select him so that they would recognize that. Anyway, that's a whole other thing, right? <laughs> so who's the kind of king that God selected? Next was a little shepherd boy. <laughs> working out in the fields, taking care of his daddy's livestock. Um, So King David comes up, and then King Solomon, of course, is David's son. So here we have uh, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the, I've got that covered up, what's that word, as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. They were eating and drinking and rejoicing. It's a good time to be an Israelite here, right? It's a good time. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines, the border of Egypt, and they brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. This is significant because of this statement right here. Ruled over all the kingdoms from the river. What's the river? We talked about this last week. Whenever you see a reference where it just says the river or the great river, what river is it talking about? Euphrates. It's talking about the Euphrates. Which, if you can think back to that map we had a minute ago, Ur of the Chaldeans, where Abram came from, that's the Euphrates way over here. Israel's that strip of land was way over here. King Solomon had reign over all of this land, right? Most of the maps of Israel that we see cover a space of about 10,000 square miles. Solomon's reign covered 60,000 square miles, okay? The state of Florida, 65,000 square miles. So King Solomon's territory and all these nations brought tribute to him, as it says, was the size of the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty big kingdom, right? Okay. Um, Oh, here we go. I forgot to put that in here. So here's the Euphrates. Here's our strip of land, right? And it actually extends over this way a little bit further. But this is what we have under King Solomon's reign. This, what's this little thing here? That's the Wadi El Arish, right? That's the brook of Egypt, the little river down there we were talking about. So all of the promises that God made had been fulfilled at this point. So with this, I wish we could get that. Okay. There we go. No, that didn't help, did it? All right. With this, the nation land promise was fulfilled. Jehovah had made of Abraham a great nation, had given the land of Canaan to that nation. All right. We're going to get into that next week. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for kind of hanging on for the ride. I know we went through that quickly, but it was important to all that stuff today. Oh, my goodness. Hey, Harry. Have they seen it?